Hi, everyone. I'm here with Oscar Pedozo, and Oscar is the CEO and founder of Thimble. And Thimble is an online STEM school for teaching robotics, coding, technology. And it's really impressive, uh, the traction and revenue that you've already incurred since founding the company, Oscar. So I'm excited to visit with you and find out more about your story. So let's start out. Uh, Let's talk about your background. Share with the investors and people that are watching this interview as far as, you know, where you came from, that journey of where you started out education-wise and now having become the founder of Thimble. Definitely. And thanks, Jerry. So nice to meet you. Uh, so a little bit about myself. So I'm originally from New York City. Uh, my parents are originally from Central America, uh, Honduras and Costa Rica. So uh, also happened to be the first one in my family to, to go to college, uh, graduate high school, actually graduate college, and then also start a business. And uh, education is, uh, I've been in education my entire life. So after, even during college, I was working part-time as a college admission officer at the University of Rochester, where I, where I went to school in Rochester, New York, studied uh, math and computer science. And then afterwards, uh, ended up getting a full-time job working in higher ed as a college admission officer. So I was doing that at Rochester, the University of Rochester and then Cornell, and then got a little bored of that. I actually ended up working um, as a tutor and college, ad college admissions officer on the side. <laughs> uh, and that's where I really started working with kids uh, and mo mostly in a public school setting who just did not have access to top-notch education. Uh, I spent about three years working in inner city schools as a math teacher. And that's when I realized how problematic the education space is. Uh, and that, that's when I knew I wanted to spend most of my life working in education. And um, we just didn't have the programs in place at the school or district to be able to provide top-notch programming for these kids. And so fast forward to 2015, I was uh, volunteering most of my time at a maker space in uh, Rochester, New York, where I would, my co-founder and I would eventually um, tutor these families that would come in every Monday night to learn how to build robots, learn how to code, build drones. And after about two years of doing that, we had a list of about 300 families who wanted us to tutor their kids, which was just impossible because that's a lot of people to tutor. So we ended up proposing an idea around Thimble, which at the time was just an idea, but uh, we would create these projects and uh, video record ourselves teaching these lessons. And that's really, you know, the connecting the dots, at least that's how we got the idea started. And uh, tell me how the name Thimble came about, because we talked a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. I was, um, I was kind of a geek in high school. I did robotics uh, all throughout middle school and high school and was part of a team one year we were we were part of this competition where we had to build a robot from scratch. And then at the end, we had to um, design and sew clothing onto this robot, which was pretty weird for us at the time. But uh, we ended up doing that and uh, the robot worked great. But the only thing we hadn't accomplished quite yet was sewing the clothing onto the robot. And none of us had any experience <laughs> sewing before. So um, on the day of actually putting everything together, we were sewing and we kept cutting our fingers and one of the one of my teammates moms happened to have thimbles in her purse so she gave us a bunch of thimbles to successfully sew this piece of clothing on well anyways it became an inside joke and we ended up calling ourselves the thimbles for a while until we graduated high school and uh when i started the business <laughs> thimble was one of the one one of the contenders for the name of the business and that's what i ended up going with that's a fun story. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So let's kind of dive into what Thimble does and what you're about. And I'd like to start off by first asking you, Oscar, if you could do what we call in the, you know, the industry, a quick elevator pitch, you know, maybe, you know, a minute, a little over a minute, just kind of going through all of the key points of where, you know, what your startup, you know, the problem, solution, Go to market, revenue, you know, monetization, all of that. Just give us a quick overview, and then we're going to dive into that a little deeper. Yeah, definitely. So, Thimble is at least our vision right now is to be the world's largest online STEM school for any child. 
And we do that uh, through a curriculum that we provide for K-12 schools. So in particular, this online STEM school teaches a variety of skills, coding, robotics, technology, any sort of skill that you can think of that's in high demand right now are the types of skills that we teach kids as young as fourth grade. Uh, we are working on a younger curriculum, but right now we're, based, uh, we're focused on grades four through 12. That curriculum is made up of a variety of hands-on kits. There's also a lesson software that teachers can use to help students build their projects from start to finish. And then there's also professional training packages for teachers who don't have a background in coding or robotics. And so this is a turnkey solution that we implement in schools during the school day and after school. Uh, we originally got started selling to homeschool families and that was a success. We actually launched on Kickstarter and we generated $300,000 in one month. Mm -hmm. And that was what really set us into motion back then. Um, and for us, that was a big deal because we had very limited money in our bank accounts and we were putting everything on the line for this. And, uh, but the Kickstarter helped propel us. We got our first 2000 customers in 2018. And then working with schools had always been in the back of our mind, but we ended up getting a large school purchase that landed on our lap. And for a while we were working on both the consumer and school markets at the same time. And we learned quickly that it was impossible to do both models very well. So we ended up focusing on selling to schools. Um, we had a, a plan and everything ready to go. And of course, March, 2020 happened. We all know what happened then. And so uh, we ended up putting that on the back burner. We ended up reverting back to our consumer model because everybody was pretty much forced into homeschooling in 2020. Uh, so we ended up surviving the pandemic, thankfully. And then in 2021, we revisited our school plans and uh, ended up getting our first district-wide contract in Dallas, which is about 230 schools. And it just became a domino effect after getting Dallas. Um, after Dallas, we got Atlanta. After Atlanta, we got San Antonio and all these other schools. We just helped validate the fact that we were on the right track um, providing these curriculum programs. And so that's, that's really, you know, high level at least <laughs> um, what the mole is at the moment. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. And congratulations on the success to date. And uh, so let's, let's talk about obviously, you know, you covered the, the problem when you're sharing your background, you know, getting, especially this type of education to our youth is important because it is the future. And I think that's, you know, fairly well established in this day and age, especially having just returned from CES, you know, the <laughs> myself, it, it's, you know, technology is the future and STEM robotics and what you're doing is, you know, critical for, you know, continuing for the young people to grow and be able to move into that sector. Starting as young as possible, I always feel with anything is is critical and important. Uh, talk about how do you provide then the hardware kits and the online talk about kind of that process. What happens when the school district says, Hey, we want to sign on board with Thimble. What's the process then? Yeah. So when we win a contract, uh, I'll use Dallas as an example because they were our first one. Uh, one of the first things we do is connect with their procurement officer. Uh, normally when a school district has a particular challenge they want to solve, they publish an RFP for a specific service or product. In our case, it's an RFP around robotics, coding, STEM education, or CTE, which stands for Career and Technical Education. So uh, back in February of 2021, we saw this RFP that had been published by Dallas. We ended up applying. It was a little bit of paperwork, but we ended up putting a solid proposal together. And first time around, we ended up getting the contract. So when that happened, we immediately got in touch with the procurement officer to get a lay of, lay of the land for the entire district. 230 schools is a lot of schools. And so what the district ended up doing was identifying all the contending schools that would be a good fit for our curriculum. They gave us the decision makers for each of those schools. There's a budget that had already been allocated for us. And then there is no school board approval that needs to be made because we've won the contract. So um, what we end up doing is getting in touch with a principal, a curriculum director, or a STEM coordinator, which are usually the th three most common decision makers in the districts that we work with. 
And then from there, we sort of assess the problem, try to understand what they're currently using. So it's really all about understanding like why they need this curriculum. A lot of times they don't have anything or they want to implement this in the after school program. Uh, or they they just got funding for a new tech facility, a library, or a makerspace. So depending on what scenario we hear is when we'll come in and, and provide a, this curriculum offering for them. The curriculum is a four-year roadmap. So in the beginning, uh, it's really providing beginner-friendly type projects for the students. Um, we'll usually ask how many kits the teachers need. Uh, normally, it's uh, various classroom sets that they order. And then from there, we'll get an understanding of how many students are going to be part of the program to give us an idea of how many licenses to charge. And then if we're working with teachers who have no idea what they're doing, we'll also try to get an idea of how many professional development hours they need. And all the once we get that entire, um, once we get all those answers, then we start coming up with, with quotes and purchase orders and then we're able to deliver on the program. Okay, those, those kits that you're referring to, are those kits that you do yourself or are those outsourced kits that you get from suppliers, providers that fit the need? Yes, uh, so we make, uh, so I say 75% of the kits that we have, we make ourselves. Okay. Uh, so we design them in house, they're manufactured overseas in China. And then we also work with another provider in China um, that create that creates various electronic sensors that would be too expensive to make in house, and so we're able to combine those with some of the parts we make in house and fulfill everything in a nicely put together kit. Okay, great. Well, what what are the margins look like on that for you then for the kits and the hardware component? Uh, about seventy percent. Okay, yes. fantastic. And I would imagine as you grow in scale that even can be improved upon or pricing brought down one of one or the other, whichever makes most sense at the time. That's right. Yes, we did have, we did start off with pricing that was a lot lower, um, mostly for the consumer side. For schools, we ended up looking at the, at the market to understand how other companies were pricing their kits. And we ended up increasing the price and we introduced a, a lifetime warranty for, for our kits. Great. Um, to justify, you know, a higher cost, and, sure. and uh, that's worked out pretty nicely. Fantastic. So uh, let's talk about the market. You know, let's talk about the overall market. And I know you have some statistics as far as how many schools have uh, this type of educational program built within their, you know, curriculum. And uh, so let's talk about the size of the market. And also how you're going to be going to that market as you are wanting to scale and grow now. Definitely. So there are about 132,000 schools in the U.S., uh, both public, charter, private schools. And then there are about 13,500 school districts. So we're mostly going after public schools at the moment. Uh, a key target audience right now are public schools that identify as Title I through V schools. Title schools uh, are all categorized by the level of need within a district. Title I, for example, would be focused on schools where there is a number of a high number of economically disadvantaged students. And, um, and so those are specific schools. About 33% of public schools have a coding and STEM program. So those are the ones where we're focused right now, uh, but that does not limit us to uh, other schools like charter schools and which are basically public schools as well, but private schools. Uh, and then that's just in the U S there's also a market outside of the U S as well, just based on conversations we've had in the last three months that could be something that we scale into over time. But for now, you know, we're just focused on the U S Sure. Great. So how are you uh, going to grow this and scale this as far as your go-to-market strategy then? Well, um, last year we had zero contracts. Right now we're sitting on 21. Uh, most of them, I'd say 15 out of the 21 are in Texas. So our strategy right now is to focus on Southern states, particularly Texas, because Texas alone has about 1,200 school districts. And in Texas alone, we could grow 10x. And so 
Um, but the, the strategy is to focus on Texas and then build a groundswell. Uh, Florida is our next state and then California. And then the idea is to then start to take over the entire U.S. Um, is, is that strat? I'm sorry, dinner. Is that strategy based on statistics as far as the presence of STEM or interest in STEM? Then why those specific states are where you're looking at? A little bit. There's a, a little bit more funding allocated for STEM and CTE, okay. in in especially in Texas. And it's such a different conversation when we're doing demos with those schools. You could just tell that there's a high value placed on STEM education and making it accessible, not just to kids who know they want to do this, but to kids who have no idea what this is at all. And uh, whereas up north, a little different, it's a little bit of a tougher sale. There's still a need for it. It's just we're, we're going where there's a path to least resistance and that's where it is right now. But that, that strategy has helped us win these other smaller ones in Texas, you know, places I've never even heard of, like um, Yesleta, Texas. And uh, there's another one that I would never heard of before. But, you know, these smaller ones like Waco and Fort Bend, Fort Worth. These are where we're winning these, these, these various contracts. And we just submitted one in Houston, which is like top 10 school district in the U.S. Great. Uh, so talk about your revenue model. Uh, how, how does the revenue work as far as you know, pricing on, uh, you know, I, your, your chart, the hardware, you know, the kits are paid for, there's a licensee. Can you kind of just give us an overview of the, the cost on what those are and uh, talk a little bit then about how yeah. you then what the revenue you have incurred over, especially, you know, 2021 based on your program? Yeah, so I would say our model is, is um basically like software as a service with the option to buy hardware. And so our curriculum, I'd say about 60% of it is software based where we're just teaching kids how to code and understand robotics content. For those schools that want to go the extra mile and have those hands-on, that hands-on experience for kids, we sell the kits. So the licenses are $28 per student year, per student seat per year. The kits are $149 per kit. And then the professional development can range anywhere from $1,500 to $5,000, just de depending on the number of hours needed. Uh, but all of that combined gives us a, a, a package price that we, that we offer to the school. Okay. And uh, share how the, how the revenues work for you then. Uh, I know, especially like 2021, if I remember correctly, to the tune of somewhere 700K or something you had for revenue in 2021, yes. which is outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, we did just a little under 700K in revenue. And uh, I would say that a third of that is recurring revenue. And the goal is to continue increasing that. That The, the recurring piece was not something we had, or rather the software license was not something we had before 2021. And that's helped us uh, just have that revenue there that we know is coming in this year. Um, whereas before, historically, we were only selling the kits and training. Um, but I think everything happened at the right time because the lesson library took a while to put together and there's now like hundreds of lessons on there. I mean, that's gonna be our bread and butter for sure going forward. And I could see that being definitely more than a third of the revenue coming in in the future. What, what are your revenue projections over the course of the next like uh, one to five years? So our, our goal for this year is to hit a little over 2 million in revenue. That, and that's providing that we sell into 175 schools. The, the average purchase price is around $15,000. Although the highest purchase order we've received to date is around $70,000, just to give you an idea of how large they can be. Uh, but fast forward at five years from now, we're, we're looking at, well, at least numbers that we're projecting that we'd like to hit. Uh, range anywhere between 40 to 60 million in revenue. Now I've put together some projections. There's a worst case, base case, and best case, sure. just depending on each of those numbers. There's one that's, you know, our worst case scenario assumes that we're not going to hit numbers that high, but I'm looking at obviously the best case and that's what we're really shooting for. Okay, great. And so, you know, we kind of covered the go-to-market, what the market's like, 
your revenue, what you're doing as a company. But as we know, the, the STEM space can be a crowded space as far as programs that are out there. So let's talk a little bit about the competition and uh, who you're looking at out there that are doing similar things to you and kind of share a little bit about that competitive market. Definitely. I would say the, the market can be bucketed into three different or you could probably place these competitors into three different buckets. It's probably the best way I should word that. You have your Khan Academies of the world. Then you have your kits, kit providers of the world. And then you have your live classes, live tutoring companies of the world. And we're sort of like at the middle of each of those circles. Uh, I would say one, our niche is computer engineering and advanced programming. So to be able to teach that, you have to have an expertise in those. A lot of our competitors teach that very, very on the surface. Uh, I would also say that a lot of our competitors are more toys than anything else, which is great for the younger kids. But I would say you're going to want something that pushes the envelope for those older kids who have developed an interest where we are teaching high school, college level material in middle school and high school, and even allowing some of these students to earn certification so they can go on and get internships down the line. Uh, and the curriculum, I, also, I would also say, is comprehensive in the sense that when you're done building that first robot, it's not uh, you know, like a one-trick pony where there's no longer anything else you can do. When you build one of our robots, there's always something else you can do after that. And that's one of the big selling points for, for or buying points for a lot of the schools that we talk to is, is there's that streamlined program that spans multiple grade levels and not just one. So, you know, when your fourth graders graduate this year, there's going to be even more stuff they can do with us next year and so forth. Sure. Okay, that's great. Uh, so let's move into once the traction, I think we've already pretty much covered. I mean, your revenue is pretty, pretty good example of the traction that you have going on. Uh, do you have uh, some LOIs or deals in place uh, right now moving forward uh, into 2022 or things that you're excited about that you, you would consider helping gain that, get to that $2 million goal? Yeah, I mean, the fact that we have, so we have more pipeline than we can handle right now is the truth. And we, out of these 21 contracts that we, that we have, we can only service eight of them. We can't even, we don't even have the bandwidth to reach out to the other districts where they're waiting for someone to sell them this curriculum. And so um, you pair that with the fact that we're winning 2.5 district contracts per month. You know, so I'm excited about 2022 in the sense that I plan to win 30 more contracts this year, which, you know, at some point, you know, like one thing I learned very quickly is like, okay, I need to go and find a fundraiser. We're leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, Cause at, at some point it becomes irrelevant how many contracts you win if you can't service them. So um, which, I, that segues us into, let's talk about the raise then. And, you know, and obvious partially here, why the raise is needed. So talk about what you're raising and what that, what those funds are going to go to. And a little bit yeah, about so raising, the terms or what you're looking at for that. Definitely. So we're raising a, a million dollar seed round on a safe note. And we're going to use that to continue to build our business development and sales team. Uh, I took a little bit of a risk hiring three people to add to our sales team because it was just me initially. And while I enjoy it, uh, I was, wasn't spending 100% of my time on it which was hurting the business. So uh, I brought in an SDR or a sales development rep. I brought on a sales rep. And then I brought in a customer success person, which almost acts as an account exec to help nourish the relationship and expand revenue over time. And that's been huge for us. We Normally selling season is January through July, which is what we're in now. Um, but we ended up doing most of our revenue last year, July through December, <laughs> um, mostly because we just didn't have a sales team beginning of last year. But uh, I, so the, a, a good chunk of the, of the round is going to go towards building out the sales team, uh, bringing on curriculum and technical expertise to continue building the user experience and the amount of content on the lesson library. 
which is tied to the recurring piece that I was talking about earlier. Um, and then the rest is going to be used for marketing, just developing um, a budget for reaching out to teachers and administrators. There's just so much that we're not doing to get in front of schools that we could be doing. And that's where we're going to be spending most of our time this year. Sure. And for anybody that's viewing this, of course, the, the deck will be available on your uh, profile, the Startup Store profile, so people can see a little more detail on all of this and see how those uh, the fund usage is going to be broken down. Uh, you mentioned sales team and adding sales team. Talk about your overall team as far sure. as uh, the background of your team. We know about you, but who yeah. else do you have on board that's helped leading this effort? Yeah, so there's a total of six of us. Uh, so Joel's my co-founder. Joel's background is in education as well. Uh, he was an online high school teacher at a cyber school called Pennsylvania Charter School or PA Charter. Uh, and he writes all of our curriculum. He develops the kits with one of our engineers who's technically an intern. And then we have um, Aaron, Rose, and Myra who are our sales team members. And then we have Patty who manages supply chain, customer service, and shipping. So we all wear a lot of hats, but the goal is to eventually uh, parse out some of these roles into actual role, um, departments. Okay, fantastic. Uh, let's talk about, uh, just for a quick second, what, what are you looking for in an investor? Uh, do you have specific uh, type of investor in mind or, you know, what, who would be your ideal investor? I'm looking for investors that invest in education, social impact, future of work. If an investor happens to have kids, they can obviously, hopefully identify with this problem that some of our schools here in the U.S. just do not have the modern training tools or curriculum to teach students skills necessary for to succeed in the digital economy. Um, I'm looking for investors that have connections to districts, schools, even if it's locally, like if, if your kids go to a school, I know administrators oftentimes listen to parents. So um, anything to get our foot in the door in that sense. And then any investors that has any connections as far as um, distribution channels, that is not an area that we've really looked into a lot, whether it's working through a publisher or an independent distributor that could help us just get the product out uh, to, to more districts. That, like I said, is probably a weak area for us, but it's on the back burner as a possible way to continue to generate more revenue and awareness. Okay, great. And what would be your, your future exit strategy then? What have, what have you thought about in, the, in that case? For me, it took me a while to get to this point and have an answer for this, but um, we're looking for an acquisition. There, the ed tech space is very hot right now, and there are multiple players in the space that I think could be consolidated into one. We've actually already been approached by a larger ed tech giant. This was back in early 2021. There was a company in the UK that was interested in acquiring us because of our relationships we were developing with districts, which they almost, per the CEO's uh, verbatim, said that these relationships are basically assets because mm -hmm. it's normally very hard to sell into a district. And without the, right, uh, without the right approvals and the vendor agreements and the awards and contracts, it can be very cumbersome to sell. So we're still talking to them, but that, that is one possible avenue is to, to be acquired by someone in the space. Sure. So let's get you to that point where you are going to benefit more from an acquisition, which means scale and grow. And, you know, Definitely. that's fantastic. You know, you're, you're doing a great job. I'm really impressed with what you've done because they're correct. That isn't easy to get into those districts. And, and it's kind of remarkable the job you've done over the last, especially the last year, uh, getting into those districts. And a lot of times, you know, once you get into X amount of districts, then it makes it easier, I would assume, or I think at least from little knowledge I have in other areas of districts, that once you built up the credibility of being in so many districts, then it makes it easier, you know, as other districts look at 
accepting or approving what you're doing. So, you know, kudos to you and your team for what you've accomplished so far. What's what's the best way to, way to reach you, Oscar? I can be reached by email. My email is my first name, oscar at thimble.io. Uh, I can also be reached on LinkedIn. You can find me at Oscar Pedroso and my cell phone, if you'd like to reach me there too. That's fine. Um, 585-730-1413. <laughs> and and this, that information will also be uh, scrolling on the video as okay. people are watching it. So if they didn't catch that from that, they either can reverse or they can, it'll, it'll be on the screen. So that'd be available for, for the people as well. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Do you think we might've overlooked or? Um, you know, one thing I was thinking about that I wish I'd mentioned earlier was just that uh, my first language is Spanish. And so a lot of the curriculum we're developing right now is also in Spanish, okay, which is important. huge for a lot of schools where there's normally not enough content in that language. Uh, but we're also opening it up to other languages too. Uh, we've worked with a couple of schools in Florida where the uh, second most popular language aside English and Spanish is Creole. And mm. so we're developing lessons in Creole. Wow. And that is a huge buying point for a lot of schools as well. And so we're gravitating to what we keep hearing is needed. And, you know, as a Latino founder, you know, those are very important things because, you know, these in the end, we're we're trying to reach out to more women, underrepresented students and students with special needs, which in my experience as a math teacher, when I was working in these inner city schools, these were the kids that had so much potential, but there was really nothing being done for them to especially those that aspire to go into tech. We couldn't do anything for them, let alone the ones that had no idea what tech even was. And so that's really, I want, I want to bring that up because that is, that is a huge part of why I wake up every day. So, And that's great. And, you know, it's obvious, you know, that you enjoy what you do. You have a passion for what you do. And, but I do have to say, I mean, you, you have a great relaxed approach about sharing everything. And I mean that in a positive way. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been nice learning more about you and what you're doing with Thimble. And I do wish you the most success in the future and look forward to keeping track of what you're doing in the upcoming years here. Thank you so much, Jerry. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time, Oscar. Thank you, Jerry.